So you start, right? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to another episode of Computer Vision Talks. Today we have with us Ivan and Adam, and we're going to discuss their work on scale equivalent equivariant CNNs for computer. Uh, the paper reads scale equivalent Siamese tracking. The paper was accepted at WACV 2021. And uh, let's know a little bit more about the authors. Ivan is a PhD student at UVA Bosch Delta Lab at the University of Amsterdam. He received his master's of science from Moscow Fistec with honors in 2017. His research interests include symmetry learning in computer vision, learning invariances in neural networks, CNNs with a flavor of differential geometry, and invertible models. Artem is a PhD student at UVA Bosch Delta Lab at the University of Amsterdam. Artem received a MSc in Applied Maths at Skolkovo Institute of Science and Technology in 2019. His research interests include object tracking, differentiable and combinatorial optimization, equivariance, and symmetries in computer vision. We are glad to host you today. Please go ahead. Yeah, just a short note, the title slide scale equivariance CNNs for computer vision. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know why it's just computer, but okay, yeah. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, it's scale equivariance CNNs for computer vision. The word vision is somewhere, not on this slide, but it's not a big deal. Okay. No yeah. yeah, okay, so we decided to split the talk into two parts. Uh, firstly, I will talk about the basics of um, equivariance, invariance, and scale equivariant CNNs in general. And then Artyom will show how it can be applied to uh, real cool computer vision tasks such as uh, visual object tracking. Um, well, first of all, we all know that convolutional neural networks or CNNs, they demonstrate state-of-the-art results in, um, in, I think, almost any computer vision task. Okay, a year ago, it would be absolutely true. Now we know that uh, transformers uh, kind of uh, demonstrate very, very competitive results and maybe one day they will, become, and they will become even better. But for now, we discuss just convolutional neural networks and can be applied to image classification, then uh, a CNN is just a function which transforms the image into a label. It can be applied for image segmentation, object tracking or detection when the output of the model is a mask or a bounding box. So something which is not a scalar, but either a matrix or a polygon or and something like this. And in all these tasks, uh, CNNs demonstrate very good results. Uh, but what is the reason? Uh, well, one of the reasons uh, of such a success is that um, convolutional neural networks, um, they, they use convolutions as main building blocks. And what's convolution? Um, it's an operation uh, where the input and the filter are used. And the filter is locally compared to each patch of the input and it's compared by using um, the inner product between the vector representation of the patch and the vector representation of the kernel. And this inner product uh, can be interpreted as similarity. And then, uh, and then for example, uh, we can easily say if something is detected um, in, um, if you have a filter which, which tends to detect small eyes, for example, and if um, an operation of convolution gives us a very good value, very, very high value, we can definitely say that the eye is detected in this position. And uh, here you can see the animation how, how convolution actually works. And a very good thing which we can get from this animation is that, well, the, the operation itself does not depend on the position. So it's exactly the same operation being applied to all position. And as a result, it gives us translation symmetry. Um, on the left, we see that Lamborghini is being moved and the output of convolution is being moved in the same way. If we now center the image, if we renormalize the image, we see that the normalized output stays exactly the same. And this translation symmetry is very important because the analysis, the analysis of the original image and the shifted image um, the analysis of these images are equally simple. And also, as I said, if we, if we know that, for example, here we see um, a co-can, if, if we have a detector of such cans, uh, if, 
if we detect it in one position, then we move the can, we can easily detect it in another position. And the position of the maximum response is the position of the object we are looking for. Um, here I just call it um, translation symmetry, but actually um, it can be split into two parts, uh, invariance and equivariance. Well, let's say we have a function f, um, which takes as x as an input, and we have a transformation g. We say that f is equivariant under g if there exists g prime such that f of g of x is g prime of f of x. And what's important here is that g prime should not be dependent on x. It should be dependent on g. Well, uh, usually we consider a much simpler case, the case of invariance. F is invariant if G prime is identity. So the output for the original X and for the transformed X, G of X, they should be the same. And then we say that F is invariant. Um, and actually, um, we, we know that planar convolution, the standard convolution we just did, I just showed, it's equivariant. As I said, if we shift the input and then we convolve, it's exactly the same as we kind of convolve and then shift. I just demonstrated with a GIF. Uh, if you want to make it invariant, we just add pooling. So for example, if we choose the maximum location from the window, it will stay the same. And um, by using very interesting works of uh, Taco Ko and uh, Maurice Weiler and many others, you can generalize it to uh, broader groups. So for example, you can consider translations with rotations and it will give, it will give you g cons for different types of rotations. Uh, or you can consider, for example, um, uh, 3D objects and 3D convolutions. And in this case, it will give you SE3 convolutions um, and in all these cases, the convolution is itself is equivariant. Uh, but if you want to make the output invariant, you just use a sort of pooling. So you choose the maximum value or the, the average value uh, from the feature map or from the stack of feature maps, uh, if we talk about G-cons. Um, as, as we've discussed, um, we focus in this research and in, in, this, in this talk on scale variations. And scale variations are actually natural attributes of almost every sequence of images or every, every video. It's also a natural attribute of every pattern in the image. Well, first of all, um, it's a natural consequence of changing distances between objects or objects and the camera. And um, for example, in image classification, we want the prediction to be invariant under scale transformation. So for example, we have a bird nearby and a distant bird, the prediction should be the same, a bird. But when we switch to segmentation, for example, we have a pedestrian nearby and we know how to segment it. Our, our network knows how to uh, draw a very good mask around this pedestrian. Uh, if this pedestrian goes away, we want the mask to be downscaled proportionally. And the same is applicable to visual tracking. If we have a helicopter nearby and we draw a bounding box, the network should be equivalent. The bounding box should rescale proportionally to the rescale uh, of the helicopter. And in all these cases, we see that a proper analysis, a proper treatment of scale uh, will help us a lot. But the main problem is that standard convolutions are not scale equivalent. Here we rescale Lamborghini, it, it becomes smaller and then bigger. And if we kind of upscale the output, we see that the global structure, um, so as the local structure, they degrade a lot. And if at one scale, we actually see that, okay, maybe it detects something, then the structure actually degrades and we don't see anything. It's just a blurry, blurry spot. So we need to somehow fix this. <clears throat> and several works uh, have been proposed uh, for fixing this. Um, for example, in 2014, um, um, there was a paper scale in there is a paper scale in varying convolutional neural networks, and the authors proposed to do the following thing: um, you have a filter, but at the moment, convolution gets 
an input, it rescales and renormalizes the filter. And then it, it convolves the input with several rescaled versions of the filter. And it, it uh, repeats it again and again and again for all convolutional layers in the network up to the very end where the output of each column of the network, um, the outputs are concatenated and then classified. In this case, it's a, uh, it's a scale equivariant network, although it's, it's called here a scale invariant. Um, and uh, you, you can understand it because if the input is downscaled, then um, its, its output from column one will be exactly the same as uh, its output from column two before the transformation. So you can see a sort of, I just discussed how this G prime, which we already introduced several slides ago, how this G, G prime should look like. Um, well, rescaling of small filters is complicated. So uh, maybe there, there could be something better. And here uh, we can rescale the input image. Before each convolution, we rescale the input image. We convolute several times with exactly the same kernel and then we rescale back and we get a stack uh, of uh, um, feature maps for exactly the same image, for exactly the same channel, for exactly the same position. And then from each position, we choose the maximum between different scales. And this is our output. Um, and this network is also scale equivariant, but we can go even further. Uh, we can choose the maximum and also the argument of maximum and thus it will create two feature maps for each, for each input image. Well, all these networks, which I just discussed, they are, um, all these approaches for building scale equivariant networks, they actually fix uh, scale equivariance and convolutional neural networks. And they demonstrated very good improvement in image classification uh, and uh, maybe some other tasks. I don't remember, uh, to be honest. Uh, but in image classification, it helps a lot. But the main problem here is that um, tensor interpolations, they are very, very slow if you compare it to a regular CNN with exactly the same number of parameters. It can be, uh, it can be uh, 10 times slower for a uh, network which looks like uh, LeeNet. So in uh, 2019, Daniel Worrell, also from the University of Amsterdam uh, with uh, Max Welling, they proposed deep scale spaces. Uh, they said that, and they actually demonstrated that if you consider rescaling by an integer factor, let's say you first downscale by a factor of two, then again by a factor of two and so on and so on. Uh, instead of just rescaling the filter, you can use dilation. So you can take your filter of size three times three and if you want to make it bigger, you just put zeros between each number, uh, between each values and it becomes a filter of size five by five. And um, um, dilation is uh, implemented in all modern um, deep learning frameworks. So it can be easily implemented. Uh, this approach sorry. can be- Sorry, yeah. Ivan, where are we substituting the zeros to increase the size of, uh, size of the filter in the dilation process? Okay, so please take a look at uh, Psi 0, Psi 1, and Psi 2. Let's say you have three kernels. These kernels, they work on the smallest scale here. But now we want to somehow apply them to a bigger scale. So what we do, we want to rescale the filter. So previously we, we would do something like this. We would, we would just rescale the filter. We would take the filter and make it bigger right? By using the interpolation technique, let's say a, um, a I don't know, bicubic interpolation or a bilinear and so on. But here the authors said, okay, you don't really have to rescale it. You can just take the filter size zero and transform it into this size zero. So just this white spaces are zeros and this green spaces are non-zero values, trainable values. So the, the effective size of the filter is increased However, the computational complexity stays the same. Thus, if you consider a network with, let's say, five scales, you will just repeat this operation five times, and, and that's it. You don't really have to increase the computational complexity significantly. Okay, maybe at this moment there, at this moment there are some questions 
uh, related to the previous um, slides. I just I just rushed through rushed through the slides and I didn't stop. So no, maybe there are some questions. No, no, no. It's okay. We understood the part of uh, changing the scales of filter. There was one more slide where we were talking about. Uh, can you go back where we were? Um, like no, the previous one. Previous one. Yes, here. So uh, here, what are we actually trying to do? The canonical filter is being transformed into what? Let's say let's say you have a filter, and we can say that it is defined on scale one. Mm -hmm. We want to downscale it by twenty percent and upscale it by twenty percent. So it is a filter of of some size. We make it smaller and we make it bigger. Thus, okay. when we have an image which is transformed in the same way, we will able we will be able to find a filter with exactly the same kind of proportion. Okay, so uh, what we are trying to do is that when the image is being taken from a zoomed out perspective, so the mm -hmm. enlarged filter can deal with it. Is it like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it, uh, the network itself does not detect um, whether the input is downscaled or not. It just it just densely process the input image on all possible scales. So at the so you can think of this model as if you have the original network, the same network, but all filters are downscaled small, uh, a bit, and the same network with filters being upscaled a bit. So you just apply several networks, and you you hope that uh, either one of them will match the actual resolution of the image. And you you kind of you delegate this hope to the classification layer. You you think that it will estimate it from the um, from the training procedure. And all of the back propagation procedure and changes in weight it works normally like that in a normal CNN. Uh, right, right, right. So um, okay, if you have a layer, um, okay, well, let's consider the first layer. Uh, the canonical filter, all equations for the canonical filter will be exactly the same, right? You just get a, a gradient from, from somewhere from here and you calculate it with respect to this uh, filter. Okay, uh, you can do exactly the same for, for a smaller filter, but for, for the smaller filter, you need to back probe again to the canonical filter. So there will be one more update. And for all transformed versions, there will be one more update. But this update is not complicated because it's done by um, by multi. So it's like a smaller kernel or a bigger kernel. It is just a linearly transformed version of the original kernel. So um, the gradient will be also just a linearly transformed version of the uh, uh, received gradient from the uh, from the previous step of back prop. Understood. It's just slower, but but the equations are not complicated. And um, if you implement it in PyTorch, uh, I'm not sure about TensorFlow, but in PyTorch, it's like five lines of code, and you don't really um, you don't really um, spend your time writing extra functions for backpropagation. Okay. It's just f dot interpolate, and that's it. I got it. Hi, uh, Ivan. Oh. So this is similar to uh, shift kind of operation, right? In shift as well, we will do this kind of scale scaling. Uh, one, one more time. We have so a the, shift, the, op, shift feature extractor, right? Uh, what what shift? Is, I, I'm not sure. What is this? Maybe you can describe it. So that is uh, that is a feature extractor used to uh, extract features which are invariant to the scaling. So. Oh, um, okay, I, I got it, I got it. Oh, let me think a bit. Okay, so we want to achieve the same property in some sense, um, yeah. but the way it's implemented is different. So, okay, you, you can see some connections, you can see some similarity for sure. Um, but in neural networks, we, we solve it in a in a way which is unique for neural networks. So only a theoretical approach is, only theoretically the motivation is the same, but the implementations are different. 
Yeah. Uh, maybe we can discuss it uh, later. Because I'm not that familiar with uh, with uh, scale invariant feature extractor. Uh, I, I just never used it in my life. I just uh, read several papers about it, but maybe we can discuss it after the talk because it's it, yeah, yeah, sure. okay. It, it will not. It will definitely not affect your understanding of the next slides. <laughs> That's what I can say for sure. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. And this is deep scale spaces and. Uh, the main limitation, okay, it's a very great paper. If you're interested in this topic, I, I recommend you reading this paper. But the main limitation of this paper is that uh, it only considers scale factors uh, which are integers. And the smallest integer, which is not one, is two. So you can, see, you can consider only the original image and then an image downscaled or upscaled by a factor of two. And in real life, usually we, we focus on shallow scale variations, like plus minus 20% or so. Thus, it makes sense to find a better way um, for working with arbitrary scales. And um, actually, um, there were three papers proposed at exactly the same time. They were all submitted to iClear 2020. Um, one from our lab, uh, one from Eric Beckers, which is now a part of UVA as well, and one from, I think it's um, NYU, from Weizhou and the team. So the idea is the following. Um, we can say that each kernel consists of two parts, a fixed basis, so we just created a tensor and we do not update it in backprop, and the um, tradable coefficients. And if you want to, to create a filter defined on several scales, we just take the basis, calculate it on several, on several scales beforehand, and we save it and store it in, into the layer. And then during runtime, we just multiply it by uh, trainable coefficients and we get for free, almost for free, uh, filters defined on several scales. So for example, here we can see uh, these are Gaussian derivatives and we have three scales. Um, and if we multiply it by trainable weights, so we just create some filter out of these four functions and that's what we get. Uh, and if we multiply the second row by exactly the same coefficients, uh, we get the same filter, but it's now upscaled and so on and so forth. And then you can just easily, um, if, if it's just matrix multiplication, we can easily pack it uh, into something very fast uh, by using matrix three shapes and so on and so forth. And it will give us um, a very fast library for scale equivalent networks. Uh, and will not be restricted uh, in the scales we can use. Uh, and then we can just easily apply it. Um, and the most interesting thing here is that um, it does not require, I, I did not discuss any modifications of the network. So we don't really change back propagation, don't really do anything like this. And thus we can just take a regular network and replace its convolutional layers with scale equivalent convolutional layers. And we get all the required properties almost for free. But first of all, let's understand okay, how it will look like. Okay, so we have the image, the, the image of uh, Lamborghini, for example. And in the first layer, instead of being convolved with one filter or with uh, a set of filters, it will be convolved with a set of filters defined on several scales. And it will produce us three sets of outputs. Then on the next layer, the operation will be repeated and also some interscale operations will be calculated. And we can do it again and again and again until the very end where we say, okay, the network itself is equivalent uh, from the first till the penultimate layer, but we want the prediction to be invariant. So we want for a small Lamborghini and for a big Lamborghini to have exactly the same, exactly the same um, um, label. So we just combine all the 
all the outputs. And if we want, we can choose the maximum uh, in each spatial position, and then it will be, um, and then it will be kind of more invariant to scale transformations. And as we can see here, uh, top row is scalar covariant convolution, and bottom row is the standard convolution. As we've seen, standard convolution um, um, is not equivalent and thus the output degrades when the input is downscaled. For scalar covariant convolution, it does not degrade. It just slightly changes, but it's mostly because it's been downscaled by 16 times, and then I upscaled it by six, 16 times. That's some features, they just disappear, and this is just a nature of downscaling. But it's equivalent, as you can see. Uh, maybe you have some questions at this stage. Um, okay, so. I guess not, no, no, no questions. Okay, great. Yeah, the visualization looks great, though. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we have this thing, it works nice. Now we need to apply it somewhere. First of all, there's a benchmark proposed by several people, and we just took this benchmark. Uh, actually, we refer to scalar current steerable networks as season, S E S N, but we pronounce it as season just to just to make it fancy. Um, so okay, we took MNIST, a well-known MNIST, and we just rescaled the images. And then we took a regular network. Um, just three convolutional layer and a fully connected layer, just a very simple uh, LeNet uh, like neural network with uh, 0.5 million parameters. And then we just applied all the networks which at that moment were proposed for dealing with scale symmetry. And our approach demonstrated the best result in all possible regimes which uh, were proposed for this benchmark. And the good thing is that it does not introduce any new trainable parameters. So the computational complexity increases because of what I've just, just discussed, but the number of trainable parameters is the same. Um, okay, these are images um, of, of digits and they are downscaled. And well, maybe it looks very simple, but what about natural images? We consider STL10. As I said, um, birds they can be of different sizes and for example here and here the variation is okay 20 percent at maximum it's not something very significant uh, the same is applicable to cars well <clears throat> and to almost every object and if you think globally yes it, this is true but you can also think locally just take a look at feathers some feathers are smaller some of them are bigger and you also want to detect them so we take a network <clears throat> a wide res net uh, with 11 million parameters, and we just replaced its convolutional layers with scale equivalent layers, and it gave us more than 3% uh, increase in accuracy. And it's very interesting because, like, you do not change the training procedure, you do not change the um, evaluation procedure. Well, it will take a bit more to train, but with modern GPUs, it's not a significant slowdown. And well, and that's it. You just you just drop in, replace the layers, and that's it. We, we tested here three different models. We just played a bit with where to apply max pooling uh, at the very beginning, somewhere in the middle, or at the very end. And we found that combination of uh, max pooling at the very end and somewhere in the middle gives the best result. But yeah, it's almost for free. You almost for free, you introduce extra symmetry to the network, and almost for free, it gives you a boost in classification accuracy. I think at this stage, we finish with my part, and then we will continue with something uh, more complicated and uh, being applied to the video. So if you have some questions related to this part, uh, please ask them. Okay. Uh, none in the chat box. Nikhil, do you have any questions? No, I don't. Uh, I see. Great. So when you say, just one question, when you say almost at, uh, almost for free, what are the costs involved? Okay. Um, it's like, okay, you have a library, right? Um, actually, uh, the very last slide of this presentation will, will contain two links. To GitHub, and you can visit these GitHub links, and you will see that 
all you have to do is, is okay, sort of, you press command F or control F and you say, find nn.conf2d and you replace it with scale conf2d and that's it. Okay. And, this, and that, that's almost everything you do. Uh, when you apply it to video analysis, it's, it's a bit more complicated, but just a bit. It's not, it's not like um, changing the architecture globally. You just change convolutional layers. And well, um, well, if you read the paper carefully, it will take for you, uh, I don't know, like a half an hour or so just to change the code. And uh, in our experiments, we found that, well, there is a slowdown in training. Uh, we used, for example, 1080Ti and it took uh, like eight hours for a regular network and 20 hours uh, for a scale equivalent version. Okay, so, and what was the data set that you were using? Hmm? What was the data set that took uh, the this? Uh, it's it's about STL10. Okay. 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 So it's like well, two and a half um, by a factor of two and a half, it's been slowed down. But well, you get three percent uh, for this improvement. Yeah. Yes. Uh, at this stage, uh, I finish my part, and then we will switch to the talk of Artom. So I'll just stop sharing my screen. Sure. Okay. Artom, we don't hear you. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so where we where we stopped? Yeah, nice. So thanks, Ivan, for presentation. Uh, so next we will discuss uh, the work which is specifically tailored to tracking, and uh, that sort of like uh, built upon the idea that okay, equivariant networks are very successful, um, specifically scale equivariant networks, but. In most papers, people demonstrate that, okay, it boosts performance, but on classification tasks. It's very sort of like common to, when you read these papers, to see argumentation like, uh, line like, okay, we need equivariance in segmentation, in detection and tracking, but improvement is only demonstrated on classification. And uh, yeah, of course, in segmentation or in object tracking, uh, like it's easy to understand why you need to be equivariant. Like if object scales, you need to scale the bounding box proportionally. And so we sort of like, um, we choose a tracking as a running example to show that uh, we can apply a scale equivariance beyond the classification. And uh, just a very brief introduction to tracking. It's uh, a challenging problem. Uh, you're given a video sequence, you're given the first frame and the position of the object in a first frame, and you need to follow the object throughout the video sequence. It's challenging because uh, it's scaling, rotations, occlusions, uh, object can disappear and re-enter the scene. And yeah, it's generally considered as uh, you need a lot of uh, sort of bells and whistles to solve that uh, um, robustly, let's say. Uh, yeah, so the modern approach, uh, I would say the mainstream approach is to solve the tracking as uh, similarity learning. Uh, right, so if we have some similarity function and if we have a template in the first frame, then the problem of tracking just boils down towards applying the similarity function to each of the frame and the most uh, similar patch in the new frame, it will be the position of the object we're looking for. And okay, if we want uh, to have a powerful uh, similarity uh, metric, uh, the usual approach is to employ something like semis network, which is which is trained like offline to just compare patches, like with a margin based loss or something like that. Um, yeah, as I said, that's sort of like uh, the mainstream approach in tracking is uh, to use uh, the semis uh, framework. And uh, here is just uh, a bit of related work. Um, these trackers, uh, they're probably not state of the art anymore. But uh, that sort of they sort of backbone most of state of the art. So the first one, CMF, yeah, it's a pretty old one, uh, and it's actually just uh, extracting features and cross correlating the features. So you cross correlate the features extracted by the network from a template and from the frame. You obtain some heat map, and the the maximum the maximum position in this heat map it sort of like indicates the location where is your object. Um, 
yeah, FC stands for fully convolutional. I will explain later what does it mean. Uh, next, there is also, um, yeah. What do you mean by when you use the word cross-correlate? Uh, so it's just it's just correlation between the features uh, from the templates and uh, from the frame. Uh, in uh, like in deep learning, we usually call uh, uh, correlation by the name of convolution. Mm -hmm. right. So it's so it uh, the correlation between two subsequent slides of one video input, or what is the template that you're uh, saying about the mask? What is the template? Uh, yeah, so there are different approaches of uh, um, how to do that. Uh, like the approach most of the papers adopt is that uh, the template is just the first frame, the object in the first frame. Right. Because like, you know the position, you're given the position, it's only reliable information you know about the object. And then you uh, cross correlate the features of the template and every frame uh, in the video. Got it, thanks. Yeah, so this is CMFC. Uh, next, uh, there are also architectures based on uh, so-called regional proposal networks. And it works uh, just briefly. You have a set of predefined anchors and you have uh, two heads of your network. One head say that, okay, this anchor is active and anchor is just the region uh, in the image, some like default bounding box. Uh, it says like, okay, the object is contained in this region, and then you apply uh, something like regression hats to uh, refine the position of the object from this region. Um, so people call it um, region proposal network, and obviously you can do that in semi fashion for and adapt it for tracking. Uh, there are also extensions uh, of that, uh, where people like use uh, stronger networks, uh, use uh, multi-layer region proposal networks, so on and so forth it greatly improves the performance of the tracker. Yeah, uh, the one thing they share is that sort of like you read these papers and uh, they always use some shallow backbone like AlexNet or some of them use VGG. And these are recently, uh, these are relatively recent papers and you're sort of like surprised like, okay, guys, why do you use shallow AlexNet? Why don't you use something like ResNet or Inception? And there is actually a, um, a very solid reason why uh, why the shallow networks are used. So there was this paper called Deeper and Wider Semis Networks that showed that, okay, uh, if we use deep networks, something like ResNet, then we lack translation equivalence because if we go deep, we need to add padding, um, padding operator, and padding it sort of like tends to center all your features. So all your features uh, will end up somewhere in the center and it will not be translation equivalent anymore. And essentially in tracking the lack of translation equivalence, is, uh, it causes something which is called location bias. And it doesn't mean that you cannot recover the position of the object, but it means that, okay, your network needs to learn to compensate for this bias. And it's not super reliable and usually it results in poor tracking. So in this work, we ask the question, okay, why do we focus on translation equivalence only? Like, okay, if we want to uh, estimate the position of the object, of course, like translation, it's the key transformation in tracking, but is it like the only one transformation? As we saw, object like may scale, rotate, or there are maybe illumination changes. And the same argumentation line as with translation equivalence actually applies here also, because if you don't have scale equivalence, for example, you will have a scale bias. And again, your network will need to learn to compensate for the scale bias and usually it results in uh, unreliable tracking. Yeah, so before going into details of our approach, let us clarify what do we mean by scale bias. So consider you have two semis trackers, a standard one and its scale equivalent counterpart. So the standard tracker, if like we wanted to find this car in this image, it most likely will be biased towards objects of one size, towards the size of the objects which match the size of the template. And in scale equivalent network, we sort of uh, able to get rid of this uh, bias. And uh, uh, in scale equivalent network in general, we are more robust in estimating interscale similarities.
so in the paper we actually provide uh, a recipe of uh, like it's essentially six steps that you need to apply to semi striker but it also works i guess for any uh, semi network at all to make it scale equivalence so here's a writing example which is uh, just cmfc uh, it's translation but not scale equivalence and to make it scale equivalent uh, we just uh, employ some scale equivalent backbone and is, uh, as Ivan said, we just substitute normal convolutions with scale convolutions. And also we have uh, some connection operator, which in uh, normal tracker is usually just cross correlation. But here we need scale equivalent cross correlation. And we can easily do that by, if we just resize um, the features of a template or features of the image, we uh, correlate uh, multiple times and then we pull. Yeah, so uh, the whole model will be scale equivalent because it's uh, the composition of equivalent functions. Yeah, one more practical consideration is that, uh, okay, uh, when we usually train neural networks, we need to have some sort of initialization, right? Uh, preferably not random initialization, but something like weights from image nets, uh, something like that. And uh, okay, for conventional, uh, just normal neural networks were easy to do. You just import the waste and that's it. But for, uh, in general, for equivalent networks, it's not so easy to initialize the, we the weights uh, from ImageNet and for other data sets. And the main reason is that, okay, most of the networks that trained like the normal convolutions, but here we have uh, the basis and trainable coefficients as uh, Ivan discussed. And uh, we somehow like, we cannot just transfer the kernels from conventional model to the equivalent model. And here in paper, we propose a simple approach that we actually solve a very simple inverse problem with respect to coefficients of uh, our network. I will not go into many details, just if you're interested, check our paper. Yeah, so now to experimental part. Um, so the first experiment we uh, um, we construct the toy data set, we call it track and NIST. Uh, so there are two variations of this data set, translating NIST and scaling NIST. Uh, the only difference actually is that in scaling NIST, uh, sort of like this uh, scale varies as a sine wave. And we train scale equivalent network and uh, just conventional non-scale equivalent network to follow the digits. And here we compare CMFC with scale equivalent CMFC. And as you can see, uh, we actually have a dramatic boost of performance in, in all cases. And these are just different uh, testing scenarios. And uh, we sort of like, well, uh, we were interested like, okay, why do we have such great boost in performance? Um, and to like, to see what's, what's going on actually, it's uh, sort of like what we did, we take two sequences. So this is just translating NIST and this is scaling NIST. So this is the scale of the object. Uh, so the dashed black line is the ground truth scale. So in translated NIST, obviously scale doesn't change. Um, the green one is a predicted scale by scale equivalent model. And the red one is a predicted scale by just a normal non-scale equivalent model. And as you can see, sort of like our scale equivalent tracker is able to follow the scale much more accurately than the conventional model. And we sort of like attribute that to the fact that, yes, we don't have location, uh, we don't have uh, scale bias anymore. Yeah, uh, then there is benchmarking. There are a lot of benchmarks on multiple object, uh, on object tracking like OTB or VOT. And here are just the numbers that we were able to um, boost the performance of the baseline on VOT, for example, on 17%. And that's, uh, that's pretty, uh, pretty good, I guess. Yeah, we also analyzed uh, uh, how the performance depends on other factors of variation because, of, of, uh, okay, in video, we may have scale variation, we may have rotation, uh, we may have uh, uh, occlusion. And OTB, it's sort of like it contains uh, uh, it contains the labels for each video for different factors of variation. And what we noticed is that scale equivalent model, which is here, uh, is a green one. It outperforms the conventional model in all scenarios. And that was a pretty insight uh, for, 
for us because we we were initially expecting that okay we well, maybe we will be just better in uh, scale estimation but what we saw in practice that in all sequences we perform better and the reason for that we attribute to the fact that okay scale is essential property of every image uh, it may be present implicitly on the pattern level like uh, some edges they may be presented on multiple scales and when you have scale equivalent network you can like effectively exploit the symmetry yeah that's sort of like qualitative results uh, just the takeaway is that um, in case of scaling we're usually much more robust than uh, the conventional model um, and just uh, I want to very briefly to mention the other work from our lab by Deepak Gupta, uh, which applied actually the same idea, but not to scale, uh, not to construct scale equivalent, equivalent networks, but to construct rotation equivalent semis networks. And sort of idea is very, uh, is very similar, but just here you have a uh, rotation equivalent backbone and rotation equivalent connection. And he also showed that it improves the tracking and also what you can do, uh, so you have a feature map defi defines for different degrees of rotations and you can actually recover the uh, the information about the degree of this rotation from the position of these feature maps so you're not only able to predict where the object is but also you're able to predict how it's uh, what is orientation of this object yeah that's uh, that's the end of uh, my presentation uh, of our presentation so the takeaway is that equivalence is a useful inductive bias in many computer vision tasks uh, we show that it also improves uh, semi tracking and we encourage you to explore equivalence beyond classification yeah check out our papers check our codes um, yeah thanks for having us great work and great improvements like uh, very impressive with the whole the graphics of moving digits were so interesting eye catching at the same time and uh, yeah yeah this one <laughs> and in fact the paper that you mentioned in the end we are going to discuss it in july after cvpr i already had a talk with the author so yeah. pretty interesting work from your place and uh, there are multiple questions that I have. One would be that, yeah, CNNs uh, focus on the, the initial layer or lighter layer of CNNs focus on your edges and stuff like that. Not, they don't go into the sharper details of an image. And hence, uh, that would be very suitable for a tracking task where uh, we are mostly concerned with the edges. But if we try to use the scale invariant uh, methodologies on some more on some more complicated task where we need fine grained information would it still hold true or would it be like would the the cost of implementation and everything overpower the improved accuracy well actually the good thing about uh, equivalent network i guess uh, about scale equivalent networks that you can always add some interscale interactions and uh, your network in the ends will just learn uh, if it needs to be fully equivalent or if it needs to be fully invariant or what level of equivalence is required. And uh, I guess the answer to your question is that in fine grain classification, it also can be applied. And uh, I expect that it will learn uh, like the degree of equivalence that is needed. Nice. Um, so may I add a bit more? Uh, okay, so the question itself is very good, but I want to, to make a small remark. Actually, um, let's consider a situation where you have a person in a crowd. Uh, well, all people look pretty much the same. So we need to actually find a detail which, which tells us that this is the person we are looking for, not the, the other one. And, and in this case, tracking will become very close to... Uh, to find grained image classification. Right. Uh, yeah, so it's like w when we solve, and in OTB there are some uh, there are some sequences like this. So we can expect that we can we actually have some intuition and also some kind of uh, prior experiment which which tells us that maybe in in fine grained image classification it also look fine. And also I want to to mention it's like 
how, how you can think about scalar covariant features. Like usually when we say, when we think about uh, convolutions, we say, okay, if there is a, um, a, a response in this position, then there is uh, the object we're looking for. That's how we interpret convolutions, okay? If we have a filter of, of an edge and it gives us high value here, then the edge is here. For scale convolutions, uh, let's say you have five scales, you will have five feature channels and each of them can be interpreted in the following way. If the edge is of this size, then this is the position. Nice. So now, instead of having just one channel, you do not lose it. You do not lose its information, but you also equip it with extra information about the potential size of the filter. Of, of, the, of the object or the feature. So you do not lose anything, you, you add extra. Thus, I don't think that in fine-grained image classification, it will, uh, it will degrade the model. It, it's only a matter of, uh, I think, choosing the right architecture. That, that's my expectation. I see. Thank you. Um, there are multiple questions that uh, we get as an input from an audience to ask for some papers. So there's a list of questions. I can start iterating over them. And in the meanwhile, if Nikhil Chinmay or any other of the audience, we have Prajwal Milan. If any of you have any questions, you can put it in the chat box. I'll stop and I'll take your question first and then I'll continue with my list. Okay. So the first question would be, how did you get started on this problem from where the intuition came? Because for anyone who's new to research, the very idea of getting an idea is the inertia. So how did you start? Okay, I guess uh, that actually, so we had this work on, uh, we had this work on uh, scale occurrence durable networks. And if you look on the semis tracking, that's actually very similar because so the idea came from the similarity between the tracking, between the architectures that are used in tracking and the architectures of uh, scale equivalent steerable networks at all. So here you can actually think about this as uh, so the template branch, the upper branch, it just provides you some feature map, which actually a filter. And you wanted to obtain uh, an equivalent uh, tracking, so you need to make this operation scale equivalent. So that's essentially the same problem that we try to solve for scale equivalent classification, but just uh, yeah, viewed differently. Um, the second question would be, when you were uh, starting with the paper, were all the skills that you needed for the paper or that ended up being included in the paper, you knew them already? Or were they acquired through the reading of the other papers? And if yes, then what were the skills? Can you point out some, some things like, for me, if I'm entering the domain, scale equivariance would be the first thing I would be reading. So were there any such skills that you had to start with? Yeah, okay, so, so who answers this? Okay, maybe I will start. Okay, um, there are some skills which are actually required for writing a good paper and I still don't have it. So, <laughs> but uh, when, when we started working on this project, uh, it was a very interesting situation because as I mentioned, okay, um, we submitted a paper to iClear and at exactly the same time two papers have been submitted. Right. So, uh, we we learned what other people did at the moment we we did our paper. So it was it's like in other situation we would we would read everything uh, prior to the to the project, but here we just we just did it at the same time. Uh, well, but later when we switched to tracking, um, it was I, th I think it became relatively easier because well there are not so many papers on equivalence and tracking. Maybe we were one of the first ones. Mm -hmm. So we just we just read the required literature and then we just um I don't know we just we, we just uh, kind of improved the skills on ourselves. We did not actually get anything from from the outside. Not uh, just not as much as sailors. <laughs> yeah yeah yes yeah. like yeah exactly exactly. So we just learned it from our own experience. Got it. 
So another interesting question that pops up is because the two papers, your ICLR paper and this paper are so interconnected that in that paper, I believe from what I understood was that you were working on the changes in the architecture. And in this paper, you're applying the same architecture. So this paper could be understood as an application oriented paper. And that could be understood as a architecture based paper. So uh, how was your experience different in both, uh, both of them? And is it true that uh, application based paper are easier? And how would you say like, how how does the experimentation or validation like because what I've seen is on application based paper, you have to validate a lot. There has been previous work. The architecture might be different, but because the application is same. So you have to match their accuracy, beat their accuracy. How is your experience? Yeah, I guess I'll tell about my experience. It's definitely the case. So there are pros and cons of writing an application paper. Uh, the disadvantage may be that, yes, so if it's only application paper, you need to demonstrate, you need to outperform the baseline probably, you need to do a lot of experiments, uh, and it just takes a lot of time actually. So I wouldn't say that, uh, I'm not sure that it's always the case that application papers are easy to, yeah, maybe they're easier to write, but maybe not easier to implement. Yeah, I, I had the same impression. So it's like at the beginning you think, okay, we have we have a hammer, now let's find some nails and the problem is done. But um, when you implement it uh, in a naive way, which, you, which actually almost immediately pops up in your head, you understand that it's not as good as the results demonstrated by the previous authors. And then you think, okay, what should I do? And there are definitely two ways. The first way is to uh, fix uh, over here and over there and use very many bells and whistles, which also works uh, somehow and somehow uh, sometimes it's the only, uh, the only solution. And this paper, we actually demonstrated that there are several blocks which are actually acquired and without which uh, the application itself is not possible. So it was also like, uh, well, it's not about the architecture. The second paper, is, as you said, it's about application. Uh, but we also spent some time for accelerating the computation. So spend some time for doing good initialization. Yeah. And what actually we found that, um, at least for me, it was like a, like a surprise um, that, well, uh, even though it looks simple, when you read the paper, people just write, okay, we had a model, we trained it, and that's it. Actually, it's like, it's a model out of 50, or something like this, or it, it's an experiment out of 50 experiments. And each of these experiments they had something and they had, maybe the experiment itself is not that complicated, but the discussion before this experiment, because like in computer vision, we usually run an experiment and it takes like five or six days before it, uh, it's finished. And thus we have to spend several hours to discuss whether it's worth uh, running the model, what, what should be changed, uh, whether it will give us some improvement or not and so on and so forth. And um, I think when we, when you work on, when, when I work on the, previous paper, uh, which was accepted at that year, it was mostly the discussion of the scientific part. It's like the mathematical aspects and the aspects of the, aspects of the group theory and so on. Here it was mostly uh, like what we expect. How do we understand uh, the field? Um, you need a better understanding of the field. And uh, our supervisor, Arnold Smulders, he actually gave us lots of, uh, lots of insights. It's like you really need to understand like what is the nature of scale or why is it being changed and so on and so forth. And only after, after you understand this, you think, okay, okay, here's the missing point. We need to fix this and then it's going to work. And that's, that's almost how it, uh, how it happened with this paper. So since you mentioned supervisor, I have a question about that also. But first in the chat box, we have Milan asking a question. Uh, Milan, do you want to unmute yourself and go ahead? Yes, sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I'm currently a PhD student and I work directly on Siamese tracking as it is. And at this stage, actually me together with my supervisor are deciding what direction to take. I have actually written a survey regarding Siamese frameworks. I'm, I'm about to publish it in the near future. So like, what's the question, that's the question for you. What do you think is the most promising direction in this area? Because you said you've done plenty of experiments and this, this is what worked and the rest did not. So 
maybe you could give me some hint. Like, okay, man, before you dive into it, try this, hopefully. And I have actually contemplated about equivariance. I have read the rotation equivariance and even this paper. And also we have some ideas about maybe some model updating and incorporating time into CMS tracking. So what, what, what do you think? What's your take on this? Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I might be not, uh, not like, okay, uh, I'm just studying CMS trackings for two years and it doesn't mean that uh, I know everything that's, that's going on, but my impression is that uh, so if you consider just the semi-trackers uh, on 2D, it's pretty saturated right now. So the impression like uh, people have tried almost everything. And uh, I would look towards the direction on applying CMEs to 3D or to two-point clouds. That might be, that could be interesting. Ivan, do you have any... Uh, okay, um, I'm I'm not working on tracking in the same way Artem works. It's like I'm not that involved in the field. My impression is that I also have an impression that the field is very saturated. So if you want to submit a paper, well, it should be better in some sense, right? But being better uh, these days is very complicated. Um, if I have to write one more paper. Uh, on CMS tracking in the nearest future, I would choose an interesting application. I would just take a look at the country I live in and the needs of the society of maybe municipality. If you're affiliated with a university which is, um, uh, which is connected to the municipality, maybe you'll be, you, you can just ask them directly. And I will just consider this problem. And if you read most of the papers, they use uh, benchmarks like OTB, VOT, and so on. And these are, let's say, general purpose benchmarks. But well, trackers can be used in many scenarios. And these scenarios, they introduce in-domain um, um, kind of problems, which you can solve. And maybe in this case, the solution will not make your tracker more complicated, but maybe it will simplify it. And thus, it will be very interesting because the model is being simplified, the problem is being uh, solved, and the paper is being accepted. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 also, I think, also, I think one possible direction could be uh, using something unsupervised, something like contrastive learning to train the trackers. I haven't seen uh, any semis trackers uh, with contrastive learning. Yeah, it definitely but, sounds great, but it's like you always, when you start doing something, at least I have this impression, or you have a great idea and you think, okay, sounds great. And it always there sounds are no great papers. at the beginning. Yeah, 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 but, and there are no papers about it. And now there are two options, either I'm the genius who invented this, or maybe I am the loser, I'm the last one who did not try it and who did not understand that it doesn't work. So maybe maybe everyone already tried contrastive learning and they just did not discuss it and maybe it just doesn't work. This is also an option. Mm -hmm. I don't but think it's no, true. At least this one, uh, even I, I am not even in this domain, but uh, looking at, because I've been inviting so many people, yes, Siamese and tracking are two words that I've heard together a lot of time. In fact, in September, I hosted a researcher from RWTH, Akin, who gave a talk on Siam RCNN. Uh, that was like visual tracking by redetection and all similar kind of concept. So yeah, I do agree that this has been explored a lot. Yeah. Okay. I hope that answers your question, Milan. Yeah, sure. Actually, when you said 3D, I just, oh yeah, that's actually one of the three directions that we were pondering. Uh, one problem would be like, okay, in domain or expertise, that's, that's usually the case because, you know, I'm not the genius. I can openly admit it without even thinking about it. So yeah, solving some problem in some specific domain. And actually in our case, it's, it's traffic, traffic related scenarios. It's just how to compare myself then considering some 
established benchmarks. This is what I think. Like for example, there is uh, there are many benchmarks for multi-object tracking in traffic-related scenarios, but single object and at the same time traffic-related, it's some it's somehow well. I have no other baseline to compare to, and I feel like there's lack of data sets and benchmarks. So, what do you think? <clears throat> I I actually think that's it's. Uh... It's an advantage to have a situation like that because uh, when you write a paper, you can uh, you can like you can introduce a benchmark, you can implement some simple models, and uh, it will be one of your contributions. And specifically for traffic light, uh, for for traffic uh, tracking, uh, I guess you can use the benchmarks for motion forecasting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I see. I see maybe it can be applied straightforwardly. You you can take the, some tra trajectory forecasting, motion forecasting benchmark because they like, sort of like provide the video and they provide bounding boxes for objects and you just use it as a single object benchmark. Single object tracking benchmark. Oh yeah, sure, okay. Thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, because yeah, we were discussing about uh, supervisors helping. So. Another question was, how did your colleagues or your advisors help you shape it? Okay, so uh, I guess the main contribution that our advisor put in this paper was uh, the correct positioning of the work. Because uh, that's sort of like the argumentation line that we, that we now have, like, okay, we have uh, uh, a lot of papers focused on translation equivalence in tracking but why do we focus only on translation equivalence so now it sounds very natural but it wasn't so in the beginning yeah it evolved so very uh it evolved uh, very dramatically from the start so yeah i guess the positioning of the paper uh yeah, that's that's where our advisor helped a lot yeah and i think also uh like when you start your project, you think, okay, I have a very good idea. I discussed it with my colleagues. I discussed it with my future collaborators and so on. And then you discuss it with your project, uh, with your project supervisor, with your scientific advisor. And um, in our case, Arnold, he actually, he, yeah, he also, he, he definitely helped us to position this, but he also asked very many questions with, which helped us to shape our understanding of the importance um, and it evolved from something like, well, we discussed it near a coffee machine to something which we can write and submit to a conference. So the, the argumentation line is stronger. And you also, also your inner understanding of the field is stronger. And this is very important, I think. It's like with colleagues, at the very beginning, you discuss the ideas. It's like, it's like a soup where, where cool ideas both kind of pops up and, and you can see them. But then when you at the later stage, when you work on it with your scientific advisor, it, it becomes deeper. It's like you understand all the aspects. And if you're not a, an expert in this field, uh, it's very complicated to understand what you do not understand. And here the scientific advisor comes. Right. I understand Consolidate, consolidating all the knowledge that is scattered. So, yeah. Um, so another question would be, wh what motivated you towards a PhD? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I just, I just uh, finished my high school. Mm -hmm. uh, then a month of, uh, of uh, summer holidays, I started my bachelor's. A month of summer holidays, I started my master's. A month of uh, holidays, and then I thought, okay, well, Okay, month of holidays, what should I do next? And then, then I just check, okay, then goes PhD, next three letters which I should pursue. Then just, yeah, I just, I just did it. That's, that's the path. And uh, what about you, Adam? Yeah, for me, uh, it's sort of like the PhD life, it, it sort of like gives you a certain, I mean, it gives you certain freedom. Uh, that's not the thing you can find somewhere outside the academia or in industry. Of course, like there are many things you can do, but yeah, the thing that I admire the most in PhD is like you have certain freedom. Right. 
and this one's for both of you you can answer in like parts uh, the question would be how did you end up choosing this research area like most of the researchers we have hosted uh, have this common opinion that because their supervisor was working in that domain so they end up choosing the similar one how was it for you were you working in the same domain in your masters also or how did you land up yeah for me i guess uh, the answer would be the same as uh like the standard answer, because before I was working on very different problem, actually I was working on uh, inverse problem in microscopy. So it, it's really different and it's like really low level compared to what I'm working now. Yeah, maybe I wanted to sort of like do something more high level and the topic that I have now, it was a good match for that. Mm -hmm. And, what about and for me, it was like Arnold Smelders, the supervisor, uh, he has a very broad kind of uh, field of expertise. So it was very, at the, at the very beginning when, when, uh, when we discussed the project, he just asked like, what, what, what would you like to do? And I said something with very cool mathematics involved. Mm -hmm. So I have a broad field where I want to work and he has a broad field where I can work with him. So it was just, okay, we just pick a, pick a direction and we follow this. Um, well, and it, it was just a match. It's like, for, for me, it was very comfortable because I, I didn't know what exactly I want to do. I just thought, okay, it should be geometry, computer vision, maybe something else. And Arnold had like, he, he just showed me different directions and it was very convenient. for me. That would have been so great, like choosing out of a buffet. Uh, well, it's not, a random, it's not a random walk. Mm -hmm. Sorry. All right. What, what, what is your mathematical background? Because I, I, it's sometimes few papers in tracking are really math heavy. Some of them are not, and you've just mentioned that you want something like that. So, do you study math also besides doing your PhD, or just is it's like a tool and I just need it? You grasp it on the fly and go on. Because I have personally a little bit, I well, empty spots <laughs> to that should be filled with better mathematical knowledge. So if you can give some advice on that. I think we all have. I just, uh, my background was in quantum mechanics and in quantum mechanics, mathematics is very, uh, very specific. Uh, but the courses which I had in quantum mechanics, they were very dense. So it's like you, you get an intuition of what's going on, but it's never that deep. Uh, like it's, it's not as deep as I now understand I wanted to study that. And now I just, with this, this enough intuition and enough skills, I just, yeah, sometimes I just read some articles and uh, watch educational videos on this specific topic just to fill these uh, blank spots. Because otherwise, well, sometimes it's required for the paper. Sometimes it works as an inspiration point. You just read something, watch something, and you see, okay, now I can apply it. And maybe you are the only guy who knows this in the field. And then you feel very, kind of, very uplifted. You think, okay, now I can do whatever I want because, well, I'm the only guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also I, ha I guess I have an impression that you can never arrive at the point when you're sort of like completely satisfied with uh, your mass knowledge and you can say that, okay, now I, I learned enough and I... I have everything. It's always that you don't know something and you always learn on the fly. Right. So uh, like this question is what I was just going to ask because like I had, I, I didn't read many ICLR papers so far because I was like computer vision focused conferences, but I ended up reading a ICLR paper on neural architecture search and following the things. It was so math heavy that it put me in sort of depression. Like, I don't know all of this. Am I even ready for a PhD? And all self, self doubts kind of situation emerging from that lack of knowledge. But I guess it is important that we have an intuition, like just not consider equations as equations, but try to derive a physical meaning out of the equations as well. Do you think that's right? Um, I, I also think that when you read a paper from the domain you've, you've never touched before, you think that it's very complicated. But if you, if you take a paper from five years ago from this domain, okay, there are maybe two equations which you don't understand. But when in the next paper, one more appears, but now two equations you already understand, you just spend some time understanding them. And uh, that, this is what makes you a sort of expert in the field. Mm -hmm. And well, some some 
fields are more oriented towards math, towards equations. Well, and sometimes physical, um, you, you said it's very important to understand the physical concept of this. Sometimes the physical concept of this is more complicated to understand than just to learn the equation and just to understand how it, it can be used. It's like, well, in quantum mechanics, for example, when people say, okay, there are dozens of interpretations, you can choose any, but it works. This is, this is the thing. And I think in computer vision, it's also like, there are very many papers which say, uh, okay, let's understand why it works, right? Okay. Like why gradient descent works uh, for a model. Well, it's like very many papers on learning theory. Maybe the physical thing is, is more complicated than the, the conceptual thing. Yeah, I guess also the case if that's when people sort of like when they need to put all the mass in like 10 pages, sort of uh, they get rid of all of the explanations. And like we recently were working on paper with Ivan and we compress it like very heavily. And now I read this paper and I see like, oh my God, I uh, uh, even I like who participated in cooking like all this mass, I have sometimes hard time understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, in, even an ICLF paper, paper is nine pages long, but the appendix is 21 pages. And I'm like, what? <laughs> reading, reading, reading. Yeah. <laughs> right. So uh, I guess that was a lot of knowledge exchange. Do we have any more questions? Uh, no, none in the chat box. Thank you so much. Uh, we have asked you so many questions and you have so greatly answered all of them in best possible ways. It was really interesting discovering your work and we definitely look forward to more quality work from you. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for agreeing to the talk. Thank you yeah, thanks for, for inviting thanks us. For having us. I'm glad, I'm glad. Great. Thank you, Ivan Anatta. Thank you. You're a very good audience. Ah, thanks. Great then. Uh, have a good day. Thank have, you. Have a bye good bye. Day. Thanks. Goodbye.